Welcome to Coronavirus in Texas, a virtual event series from the Texas Tribune. I'm Mitchell Furman, and I want to thank you all for tuning in. While the Tribune has paused our in-person live events, we're moving the conversation online with an ongoing series of virtual interviews. I'm here today with Texas Railroad Commissioner Christy Craddock, and we'll be discussing how the state's energy sector has been affected by the coronavirus outbreak until about 1245 this afternoon. Commissioner Craddock and I will also be going over questions submitted by our readers through, throughout the conversation. Before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors for supporting today's conversation. AT&T, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas, the Catania Foundation, the Cynthia and George Mitchell Foundation, the Energy Foundation, Ryan and Texas 2036. We also want to thank KPRC2 and KXAN for their media support. Though donors and corporate sponsors underwrite our events, they play no role in determining the content, panelists, or line of questioning. Finally, I'd like to introduce Commissioner Craddock. Commissioner Craddock was first elected as a Texas Railroad Commissioner in 2012. She is an attorney specializing in oil and gas, water, electric deregulation, and environmental policy. Before serving on the Railroad Commission, which regulates the state's huge oil and gas industry, she served as the chief political and legal advisor to the Speaker of the Texas House. Commissioner, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's an interesting way to do business today, right? De definitely. And just first, how, how are you doing during all this? I'm doing well. It's been a very busy two months. I say for people who've cleaned out their closet, I'm a little jealous, but we've been on the phone a lot trying to make sure the state continues to run. And we it's been an interesting few months. So I forget, I was looking at the calendar today thinking I've been through Groundhog Day a lot in the last few weeks. And I, that movie, I, I think, has been apropos. And the governor just issued, if you think about it, on March 13th, the, the uh, statewide disaster order or the order. And here we are, May 12th. And it feels it's only been two months. It feels like it's been a year. Right, right. <laughs> and, and and just last week, you you and your two colleagues, Chairman Wayne Christian and Commissioner Ryan Sitton, took a took a vote that received a lot of attention, and um, and it was about cutting oil production in Texas, something that the commission hadn't done in since the seventies. How it's been a week. How how do you feel about that vote? I think we've clearly made the right decision in my mind. Uh, look, you look at where we are and what has happened just in the last couple of weeks and. It's even more important to back up a few weeks before we took the vote of what was beginning to happen within industry. They were cutting themselves. Uh, they were, our, and we were getting, we just are coming into earnings and been in earnings season. So you're also getting perspective from what publicly traded companies were saying. But also we're seeing numbers, we were seeing numbers start to go down starting in February, to be honest. We have April, our April 2020 numbers reflect where we were in February. And we already had seen production cuts from in February, about 300 to 400,000 barrels at that point. Um, so we're begin we were beginning to see cuts to begin with. And then as you and I were going on, I said the only news that was the big news that happened between Friday and today was that, uh, you know, you've got Saudi Arabia announced they're not only going to cut another million barrels off of what they'd already committed, but also they're looking at adding VAT tax and potentially paying their people less. So they're seeing some real dollar change and seeing the need to cut as well. So I think people were, and the markets began, had really begun to take care of it by the time we took a vote last week. But um, and I think it's a very been pretty volatile, to be honest. Yeah, and it kind of started in early March uh, before Governor Abbott uh, declared that emergency. And, you know, the oil production, Demand was starting to drop, and then as the Saudis, as you alluded to, they got in a kind of an oil price dispute with Russia, uh, and the market crashed in, in early March. What What's going through your head at that time? Well, so we'd already seen a, a beginning of some uh, reset and downturn, frankly, if you go back and look at, at the fourth quarter of last year. We look at not production numbers every day because those numbers have been high, but we look at the number of permits. And so our, our permits were beginning to be off even before coronavirus happened in this country and in the world. 
we were watching the fourth quarter, they were off slightly. As we came into the first quarter of this year, we expected to be a little bit less number of permits, which were fee-based, so that affects our budget. But we expected that to kind of continue, and we thought that would we would be in a lower number than what had been anticipated when we set our budget. So that's kind of was our thought process as we started January, February. And then obviously March happened. And, you know, the day that the governor issued his, his proclamation was the first day I got a phone call about proration. So it kind of was simultaneous. The companies were trying at that point to figure out demand was going to be down. We've never seen demand be down and, and supply be up. And so that's been an, that's been unusual for this cycle to begin with. And so companies were already trying to figure out what they were going to do or not. Um, by the time I hit the week two, which I was spring break in Austin, Texas, I happened to know because I had a kid at home and we were trying to do spring break that we couldn't go anyplace. You know, I was beginning to get a handful of calls about people talking about proration. And my questions were then and continue to be what and the comments were, look, we haven't done it in 50 years. Does anybody know what we're supposed to do? So process and procedure. What does that mean? What does it look like? Do we need to do it? And because if you're going to do something that's that drastic that we haven't done it, and it is a drastic thought process, then what do we, how do we make sure we do it and do it right? And we were thought trying to be thoughtful about it too. So the conversations occurred and within 10 days of me getting the first phone call, obviously we got filing at the commission and um, for some, for two companies filed for us to look and see if we had waste and, you know, look in a five week period, we had a hearing on the 14th that I think was unprecedented really at that point One we were doing it by by uh, Zoom. Nobody heard of Zoom probably much. They've done well in the last 20, I mean, I would think two months, but nobody had heard of Zoom. And we had 29,000 people on a call that we sat for 10, almost 11 hours taking good testimony. And that was what it was about for me, was getting good information. Historically, at this agency, we look at science and facts and, and data. And so that was an interesting process for us very necessary, frankly, I think. Too. Yeah, we'll, yeah we'll, get, we'll get to that. Just, just, just in early March, March. What were, you're from born and raised in Michigan. What were, what were the oil producers there telling you in mid-March and early March? You know, I think a lot of them, and still are, by the way, saying we're going to make it. They think we're going to make it. They don't like, a lot of them don't like Saudi Arabia and OPEC anyway, and that's and nobody likes Russia anyway. That's not anything new if you're trying to be in a competitive market. Um, they try to, those two countries specifically, but the OPEC plus manipulates the market. And I don't think that anybody who's free market has free market principles, like most of Texas does appreciate that. But they, but everybody was like, okay, we're going, we're going to make it. And we said, okay, well, what else can we do as an agency to make sure that you're still around? Where can we make sure we're looking at rules? We want to make sure you are paying your people and to keep the jobs in place. What are rules we can look at as an agency? So pretty quickly we started and, and EPA got in front of us, which is amazing that EPA is ever in front of the Railroad Commission. Normally we're in front of them, but they started waiving things in time frames that were important, which we've now done. Making sure we protect the environment is really important as well. And just one more on the proration, when when that first kind of came up, were you giving it serious consideration or 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 not really? Now look, I got the phone call like I said on that Friday, and I called my office and I went, okay. And I've got uh, in, in my agency, I think I have one of some of the smartest staff, which I appreciate. And I called and I said, all right, what do we do? Does anybody know how to do this? Is anybody still at the agency that knows what this is? What is proration? We all talk about it. We hear about it. I've had in the last what, 14, 15, in the last downturn, the reality is I had some, some people say to me, you ought to be prorating. And I said, what does that mean to you? And they said, we don't know, but we think you ought to prorate. You have the ability. I went, okay, great. And by the way, these are some people who've been in the business for quite a while. And finally, they went, no, the market's going to take care of it. Please don't do it. So we did take it seriously. And that's been part of the process is, figuring out how it should work, understanding what that means. And, and I think it's been very important to hear from everybody, but all sides. And so it wasn't just people who were operators that were drilling the wells, but 
We heard from mineral owners. We heard from pipeline companies. We heard from refiners. We heard from manufacturers. People forget it isn't just one little, and we frankly heard a lot from service companies as well. It isn't one little part of the business. This affects, proration would affect every part of the, of the stream of business. And so we started hearing from a lot of people at that point, small and large of all sizes, good or bad. Yeah, and, and as kind of late March, moving into April, saw a lot of companies starting to furlough people and lay people off. And uh, during that time, what, what were you doing? So I spent eight to 10 hours a day on the phone. In fact, if you'd like to know where I was Easter Sunday, I can tell you at 11 o'clock while I was still watching mass, my phone was ringing. Um, and so, and I was off the phone at eight o'clock that night. So I did get the Easter egg hunt in, but that's about it at my house. Did get mass in before I started answering the phone. Look, it was important for, I think for all of us as an agency to hear from a lot of people. So whether it was from companies, whether it was from associations, I spent quite a bit of time on with Department of Energy and U.S. Secretary of State, other states and other, and I've talked to Canada two or three times as well, hearing what they're doing, having conversations, hearing the pros and cons and what I've realized and what I think everybody's realized, no matter what size business you are or what size company or what you do, everybody does it differently. And so we've always had a challenge in my agency, in my opinion, if we're going to do any kind of rulemaking, it's important to get everybody's perspective, uh, good, bad, and try to come to a consensus if we can. But also knowing that this agent, this industry is very dynamic and everybody does it differently. And so one size doesn't fit all. And I think that's the challenge that we continue to have with proration. Number one is how do you do it where one size fits all, but it affects everybody equally because you're picking winners and losers. So I spent a lot of time on the phone because obviously we, as an agency, we shut down the Monday after the order. Um, our people are still on the ground doing inspections. We still have people working, but um, we've been trying to figure out procedurally, process-wise, figuring out, having conversations with our uh, general counsel who then had conversations with the attorney general. I appreciate them being involved and getting lots of House, Texas House and Senate members actually were calling us congressmen. I think I, like I said, I think I spent eight to 10 hours on the phone a day, as did my staff. And I think probably the other commissioners did too, listening and asking a lot of questions. And I'm sure you heard from a lot of oil producers and others in the industry during that kind of late March, early April. There was a University of Houston study that said more than 50% of oil field workers they surveyed in this study were kind of uncertain about the future. How do you think the Railroad Commission could have maybe stabilized, helped stabilize things for those, those people? Look, I think the jobs have been the priority for all of us to begin with, right? No matter what part of the industry you're in, people are the industry. And so when you looked at proration was one tool, the other tools we really focused on because they we could do them immediately. We're looking at rules, giving people opportunity to stay in business. So, you know, look, if you've got to file, do some filing of some paperwork, that costs you time and money. Maybe we let you go spend some, spend those dollars if it's then paying somebody instead of doing some paper and administrative work that we may or may, that we're going to give you some opportunities some, for some more time once you go figure out how you really can pay your people in the short and long term. I, you know, but the challenge is going to be this. This industry last year was about 35% of the state's economy direct and indirectly. And that is not just every person who's in the industry from an oil field worker all the way to an engineer and a, and a welder, but it also affects people that, that are restaurants, hotels, um, hospitals across the spectrum. And so you've got an industry that is down. You've got a state that has no demand because nobody's been traveling or driving anyplace until about the last eight to 10 days, right? And it's going to affect everything. I don't know that as a regulatory body, we could have saved, quote, a job. But I think what we can continue to do is be have regulatory certainty so people know what the rules are. So as this industry continues to look forward, innovate, and figure out how they're going to be here in a month, 
10 months from now, five years from now, we're consistent as a regulatory agency. I think that's really important for us. And you mentioned the economy, um, how tightly tied it is to oil in Texas and beyond, you know, there's the state and local budgets that receive a lot of money. Uh, what do you think, you know, what do you think it, these agencies at the state level and at the local level have to consider when, when looking at their budgets going forward? Well, for us, and I'm going to talk about the Railroad Commission specifically, and we'll, that's a, again, a lot of moving parts across a lot of these agencies. But for us specifically, we're fee-based as an agency, which means the oil and gas industry, the mining industry, the pipeline industry pay fees to us, and that's where we get our dollars. Today, we are off 60% in the number of permits that we are issuing, which is not necessarily surprising, right? But that affects our budget long term. So we're in the process today of making sure we have we're paying and have 830 plus people on our on our uh, on our budget. We want to make sure we can keep good talent. That's a real challenge for this industry. No matter what sector you're in, as there are some dips, you want to make sure you keep your good talent and keep good people. We're in the middle of an IT upgrade. People have heard me talk about this for eight years. We're actually in the middle of it. And it's why I believe we've continued to be successful as an agency and been online. Look, our mailroom's still open, but we're now allowing a lot more online filings. Um, we're, we've got people out in trucks. We have about a third to half of our workforce has never gone home. They're in trucks. They're in field offices out working and doing permits and doing inspections, which are really important. We're still doing inspections as well as uh, allowing permits and doing our job. IT has been a big piece of that. So we're in the middle of that process. But we are know, we are looking and hearing back from, from leadership in the, in the Capitol. Look, we're going to all have to take a budget cut. So we've been looking at that. What do we do? Where are essential people? Where are essential services? Protecting the environment is always essential for us. And the other piece that we do regularly and will continue to do is plug wells and do cleanup on, and remediation of sites. So we're on target to do roughly 1,400 well pluggings this year, um, as well as about 200 plus site remediations for this this year. And um, that's in our budget for the second part of the biennium. And again, looking at our dollars, we allocate appropriately, but we will continue doing inspections and doing that part of the job as well. And kind of along those, um, a Tribune reader named Bill asks, uh, Commissioner Craddock, would you support increasing the oil and gas severance taxes in the 2021 legislative session? Why or why not? So actually, no, I would say I don't think any fees should be increased on an industry that's in a downturn right now. One, if you look at the dollars that this industry pays in, besides just the fees to us as an agency, severance taxes go to the rainy day fund. Today, the rainy day fund, according to the controller numbers that have come out this week or in the last week, the rainy day fund has $8.6 billion with a B dollars in it that's available that has not been allocated So for the next biennium. Those are dollars that the oil and gas industry pays. And frankly, I've asked that the controller delay those severance tax payments. I asked about a month ago and got a no, but I think it's important to prioritize. Those dollars are going to come in anyway. Why not allow companies to use their available dollars again to pay some people, keep them employed, and then pay severance tax at the back end instead of pay severance tax on the front end and have to lay somebody off? So I don't think raising fees is an appropriate thought process going forward at all in this industry. And you mentioned the the meeting, the 10 hour meeting, it probably almost 30,000 people, I believe, tuned in. And South uh, Korea liked us a lot that day. We don't know why, but our second highest viewership in another country was South Korea, which we all thought was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what did you what did you learn from that meeting? You know, I think we, we had 50 plus people testify that day. I think we asked a lot of questions. I took 15 pages of notes that day, legal size pages of notes. I think we asked some really good questions, one, to understand process, but two, to understand what companies of all sizes saw in the market. 
Um, the market's a big piece of, of where we are and what we're doing. That was kind of the conversation about if we're having economic waste. I think, again, I think companies see it differently of all sizes uh, of how they were going to manage themselves going forward. And we heard from different type companies and different type operators, pipeline companies. You know, they explained that if we cut oil off or if oil slowed down, that it affected natural gas, P2. People don't, and it affects natural gas. Then do you have enough natural gas in the pipelines, literally and figuratively, to go into the manufacturing world? And so how does it affect manufacturing? We all use a lot more plastic. And if you look at what we're manufacturing and need right now, we need ventilators. Well, that's all plastic today. So that's oil and gas, an oil and gas product, whether anybody recognizes that or not, for instance. So I think just understanding um, and process wise, I think people needed to be heard, though, to understand what we were, where we were going and where we could go and how it would affect them directly or not. Proration would affect them directly or not. And in that meeting at the at, towards the beginning, uh, Scott Sheffield, the C, one of the one of those who requested the hearing, uh, he's the CEO of Pioneer Natural Resources and. He said if the Railroad Commission does not regulate long term, then we will, you know, quote, we will disappear as an industry. What do you what do you think about that? Now, look, I've known Scott for a long time and I'm always respectful of the information he gives us. He's one of the first he's one of the first, their company is one of the first people who called and said, we think proration might be an answer. Uh, but I think that Scott's perspective is one perspective. We heard from other CEOs that said, no, look, we. We see opportunities. And so uh, I think we'll have an oil and gas industry. Look, it's going to look different. It always does. And that's going to be the challenge is what does it look like? How do we continue to regulate? And where I think Scott's necessarily been proven a little bit wrong, he kept telling us we were going to run out of storage at the first of May or at the end of April. Well, we haven't yet. Now, that may happen. It, like I said, it's dynamic. He told us that we would, he actually told me in a phone call that we'd go negative. But we went negative in the pricing, right? So I agree with that piece. But I think we've seen industry begin to cut have cut themselves and are doing it themselves and will survive. So that's where I think that we're gonna it's gonna look a lot different. Uh, what that means, I don't know. And ask me in six months, I could probably tell you a different answer than what I would today. It's different than what I would have told you on April the 14th, too. But I think we're seeing industry adapt and survive and frankly see lots of opportunities. So couple of those opportunities, which has been interesting, nobody was thinking about even a, a month ago. When we were talking about storage, okay, we're going to run out. Today, we're getting call, a lot of calls about, can you waive this rule? Can you adjust this rule? Can we make sure we, we're seeing opportunities for storage? That's great. So, by the way, does the U.S. federal government see opportunities for storage and infrastructure? I don't think anybody was talking about those opportunities even a month or two months ago and then being vibrant opportunities of where we could put dollars, where rules need to be revised or updated or improved. And so I think this and innovation is continuing. And I think that's where this industry, especially in this state, has always survived is innovation. And, and, and that's the way we'll, we'll continue. And I think people looking at the world a little bit differently, while a challenge is not necessarily the worst thing ever. Right. And you, you voted along, you ended up voting in, along with Chairman Christian and the chairman has, has argued for the free market to kind of dictate. Scott Sheffield said in that hearing that after, you know, after 35 years as, as a CEO, he's never seen a, a free market. Is, is he right? I see. That's where I think I agree with Wayne and differ with Scott. I think we do have a free market. You know, if you look at the price points, just for instance, based on uh, based on research and, and information out there, the free market in the United States and in Texas, if we get to 30 to 40 dollars, 50 is always nice. Right. But 40 dollars, give or take, which is where we were when this happened. We had a vibrant industry. Saudi Arabia can't do it under 93 dollars. Nigeria is now in trouble. They need 150 dollars a barrel. Um, we don't know what Russia is, but they're somewhere in between. So when you really look at the, the free market, normal common sense regulations and 
Um, and the innovation that happens, this industry survives in the United States much, States much easier than it does in other countries. So I think there really is a free, a free market and a market that is important and will be continue to be important. We got to get demand up. People start driving, please, and flying. That'll make a big difference, I think. Yeah, and and flaring came up at that hearing as well, a fair amount. And um, I believe it was Scott as Scott Sheffield as well who said it that flaring gives the industry a black eye. Is that true? Look, I think flaring's been on this agency's plate for a while, by the way. And Scott and I again have had a lot of conversations, as have a lot of other parts of the industry. We've been focused in my office specifically since the fall on it. Um, and I think flaring is a separate conversation, the proration. And you heard the chairman come at the end of our last meeting, and he thinks flaring is an important conversation. Industry thinks flaring is an important conversation. Uh, look, we have rules in place. It is a good time as we are in a pause mode to look and see all of our rules and see what needs to be adjusted or we need to think about or do our processes better. Flaring is one of those, and we've been looking internally at data and information. I, I hope that that's part of the what we look at going forward is how we uh, process and look at data better. Um, so that's that's that conversation needs to continue, whether whatever we do, because I think, look, we, we need to figure out how not to flare, but some of it's infrastructure and some of it's companies needing to figure out how to develop their infrastructure better as well. So it's a not a short term conversation. I think it's a long term conversation about what we do better going forward. And just a few days after the meeting, the price of oil crashes again. This time it goes negative. What's what's that day like? So the day that oil went negative was the day before our second April meeting or our April 21st meeting. And well, my phone lit up. I think that's a good way to put it. And I actually have a good friend. I was I'll, I'll tell the story on her. She doesn't pay a lot of attention to the price of oil, but we text back and forth. And as it's dropping to 10 and my phone's going crazy anyway, she's texting going, when's the last time this happened? I said, well, you know, the last time it went to this low was Reagan. And then all of a sudden it went below zero. And she said, it's never happened. I went, that's right. It's never happened. Um, but look, if you look at those dollars, um, that's that's the futures. The interesting thing is a week later, I was on the phone with two different operators in this state and they they called me and said, we want you to know what's going on with the price, the real time pricing and what's going on in the market as we see it. The real market, not the futures market, the real market I went, okay, and for May. And I went, OK, what's that look like? And, and I thought they were going to tell me that they needed more exemptions or more something, more help. And they said, we've made decisions. These are both smaller to midsize operators, by the way. We've made decisions not to complete some wells in May. That seems to me to make good sense, right? You know, you can't get it to market or you can't, or the price is net below 20. That seemed to be good common sense to me. They said, we have those some contracts that we have to fulfill, oil contracts we have to fulfill based on what we thought we were going to draw. They said, we've gone out on the open market. One company told me they had two different buyers go out and look, marketers and buyers go out on the open market and look for oil. They couldn't find any. They were having a very difficult time fulfilling their real-time contracts in April and May. So the market shifted really quickly, I think. Uh, and I think that's where companies are now figuring out what what they need to fulfill their, their obligations within the market. We're still issuing drilling permits. I think we're issuing about 20 a day. Everybody thinks it's interesting. I'm not sure if I'm a mineral owner today. I want somebody drilling on my property, but maybe they see an opportunity. And so that, we, you know, as a regulatory agency, we continue to know we've got to be have certain rules in place and we'll continue with that. But I think the market is really fluctuating that much. And real-time market versus what you see going on in the futures is, is different on the ground. And there were some critics said that this was an opportunity for Texas to lead. Do you think Texas is leading? I think Texas continues to lead. Look, I, you know, I don't know what lead means in this context of prorationing. That's interest. That's a, an interesting conversation. But I think when you look, we again, we were all talking to other states and other and 
DC. We were talking to to Alberta too. They all wanted to see what we were going to do. I'm not sure there was any guarantee anybody was going to follow us, number one. And two, why would I disadvantage Texas and the mar- our market for New Mexico when all anybody has to do is just move over to New Mexico and disadvantage our the taxes we'd collect, disadvantage our workers when there was no guarantee that other states were going to do anything. And so while Texas, it was interesting, the concept was interesting, but again, I go back to where we started our conversation today as with the announcement that Saudi Arabia cut another million barrels of oil and we didn't do anything as an agency because industries and the markets already. And I think that's what other states could, like, I think Oklahoma had their hearing yesterday, North Dakota has another one, um, New Mexico has taken it off the table completely. The federal government has said they are, and they're the second biggest producer when you look at the feds and just look at numbers. They've said that they think the free market's going to work. So, you know, one state with 4 million barrels of oil on a 100 million barrel an oil day uh, market worldwide is a drop in the proverbial bucket, so to speak. And I think companies had already begun the cuts. So I don't think that that was, that's a conversation. Be, if we had multiple states together, I think all of us agreed and then that may be a different conversation, but one state by itself, I don't think made a huge difference. And then that other meeting in, in April, much quicker than the other one. Um, should you have, should you all have taken a vote that day and, and given some clarity and certainty to the industry so they could move forward or? or? You no, know, I think there was a lot of conversation that we'd had. Remember oil had gone negative the day before. So we were coming out of that watching to see the outcome, number one. And two, we were only three weeks into our process. I've been at the commission now eight years, the fastest we've ever done anything. And the challenge of being a regulatory body versus being on an, an industry and in the market is they move a lot faster than we do always. And so the fastest we've ever done anything as an agency is six months. Um, and that's from research to rulemaking to ending. And that we did that with seismicity, which was considered amazing that we did it that quickly. That being said, I'm not sure we had enough information. I didn't. I still had some questions about process and procedures that we came, I had, hadn't had answered. And I'm not sure based on the, the, how much the market had fluctuated in basically a week that another week or two would have made a difference at that point. And, and this is from Tribune reader Peter, who asks, regarding the devastating impact of the global oil glut, is it time to hasten the transition to wind and solar to break free of global market forces? You know, I think that's an interesting question. You look at Texas, I always say we have a little bit of everything and we always have been um, a good market for every kind of energy source. We're a high growth state. I think we'll continue to be a high growth state. When you look at us, uh, we are the largest wind state in the entire country. But what if you talk to my friends who are in the the green energy space, they will tell you we can't do it well without natural gas and oil to be there as the, the part of the market. Because look, and I, I go back to last August when it was 100 degrees for whatever, five, six, 10 days, you know, t- our typical Texas August, there were four days that wind didn't blow. And when wind doesn't blow, we still have to have air conditioning in this state. And I think people want that and, and would like to have that happen. So I think there is room in the market for everything. And I think Texas has done a good job having lots of alternatives. We're seeing a lot of solar. You go out into West Texas, you know, you we've got sun out there. We have wind out there and and you go into the panhandle of, of, of Texas. We have wind, we have sun. Those are opportunities, but I think we need energy across the board, not picking winners and losers for the energy market. And another question, this is from Tribune Reader London who asks, Permian producers are flaring unprecedented amounts of natural gas causing pollution and waste. What steps will you, Commissioner Craddock, take to reduce flaring? So I've talked about flaring a little bit earlier too. One, we've got rules for flaring and that's been important too. And the chairman, Chairman Christian, talked about it in our last meeting as well. He's working with a task force. We're all looking at better procedures and process And part of that really is for us in flaring, looking at our data. I think that that's been a challenge for us. Part of it is IT for us. We've gone and looked and, you know, we're all in hard copy a lot of times. And so 
uh, making that easier to facilitate and figure out where we are in, in rural flaring numbers. Also, having getting companies to appreciate that one, they shouldn't necessarily come in and expect they're going to get a long-term flaring permit. I think it's a conversation we've been having as an agency and figuring out how to limit some of those permits. Number one has been going on for almost a year. People may or may not recognize that and that we've been doing it internally, but also how we can get better infrastructure long-term built out in the Permian specifically, but across the state. That's a real challenge for this industry to have enough infrastructure so we can get it to market. And then, so then you, it turns to May and you, you all took a vote and you and Chairman Christian uh, voted not to obviously implement proration. And Commissioner Sitton um, wrote that politics won and Texans lost in that case. Did Texans lose? I think Texans won because the market's working. We've got regulatory certainty, which is how companies come in and make investments. It's how Texas has done so well in the last 20 years is regulatory certainty, knowing what the laws and, and it are going to be and have a lot of opportunity and allow for innovation. So, you know, he's one perspective, but I think, frankly, the perspective of, of market, letting markets work and having good certainty in the markets long term will allow this industry to come back as well as other industries to come back and want to do business in Texas. And, and what ideas do you take, from, despite not implementing proration, what ideas do you take from the last six weeks of, or, or more of conversation about it to implement going forward? So look, one of the questions, I, I've been on the phone again after this because you know one day doesn't mean that we're finished as an agency as far as doing our job. So the next day I called some people who were for probation. I looked at them and I said to them, what's next? What do we need to do next? And what's where do we go from here? And how are we smart about recovery long-term? And so those conversations are going forward. Some of it is how some other ideas about what we use our gas for and flaring. You know, what do we use that gas for? Do we use it differently? Are there opportunities? Are there innovate, innovative what ways to use that gas going forward. Um, other things are, how do, do we need to make sure so all of our process and rules, we've been looking at other rules and, and processes as an agency, do we need to make sure we're cleaning those up so people um, with new, um, in a, so we allow innovation, but also allow people some other opportunity. You know, uh, waste is a, is a big issue in, in, as well as um, other issues that we've got. So going forward, how do we, how are we ready to go for the next phase? And I think that's where everybody's focused now. And how do we continue to keep people in jobs as much as possible? And some firms have, and you know, bankruptcy is an issue, has been an issue. What could the Railroad Commission have done to maybe offset some of those? You know, I, I'm not sure that there's anything we could have done different than what we've done, except continue to have our rules and regulations. Some of this is been a challenge is going to be a challenge for the state in this in this industry, right? And so um, I don't want nobody wants to see anybody go bankrupt. Uh, but nobody also wants to see anybody be in business that is a, a, a supported business potentially maybe they should or shouldn't still be there. So I think there's some there this is going to be painful. And the real challenge is this historically when you go back and look just well, 2008, 2009, 2010, as we came out of the Great Recession, the oil and gas industry was the industry that brought us out of the Great Recession, where the energy industry brought us out. Right now, this industry is down. And so how do we climb out of where we are today with all the unemployment, not just in this state, but across the, the country and frankly, across the world? How do you get demand back up where people are comfortable driving, comfortable flying, still Get moving forward, and how and and how do we continue to make sure we're doing the smart things so business wants to come, it has the ability to come back, and small business sees opportunity as well as big business, and and so I think consistency is going to be really important. Yeah, and coming out of the recession, the oil industry kind of helped the economy here. Now it, it's looking like the energy sector might hold the economy back. Is there a way to make up for that? Yeah. No, I think that's what people are, we're going to have to figure out in the next 
you know, 30 days, 90 days, two years from, from now, we're still going to be having that conversation. Every, every dip, and I call them dips that we've had in this industry, we, we learned something. And so what we know today, hopefully we learn something in two years, how we come out of it smart. No, people, again, knowing what the rules are, seeing opportunity, um, and, and it will change. And as an agency, this agency's changed a lot. And I, I always tell people this perspective. When I first got to this agency, we were issuing three-fourths of our drilling permits were vertical and one-fourth were horizontal. And everybody thought that was kind of a nuts idea of horizontals. It was just starting. Today, we issue three-fourths of our drilling permits are verticals and only one-fourth are horizontals. And we've had to we've had to adapt. I think that the adaptation and how you can be smart, both as an industry and as a government, will be really important as we start coming out of this. And what's the what's the future of the oil industry here? Look, I think oil and gas is not going away. Um, as much as we've ha- seen it, this dip and this downturn today, 100 million barrels is what we were. I don't know if we recovered 100 million barrels sh- in the short term. But in the long term, oil and gas is going to be here. And everything that you, you've looked at for today, tomorrow, in the future, you, oil and gas is going to be important. The natural gas part of the world is going to, to usurp coal and has begun to do that. But you look now, there are a billion fewer people that needed energy from 10 years ago. That's really important. And that part of the population worldwide continues to grow. That's not just India and China, but it's Africa and South America. Energy is really important. And the oil and gas part of that is a long-term opportunity, I think, across the world. And a lot of oil field workers in the Permian, and I'm sure they've told you this as well, they're, they're, they've lost most or all of their business. And they're worried that their, their jobs just won't be around anymore. I mean, what do you tell those people? I think that's the real challenge that we that we have in this industry. And that's what when I talk about having losing the talent, you know, we've we've seen ups and downs. And when that talent goes away, a lot of those people don't see opportunities. They go find another job. They have to have a job. And so that's the challenge we will have. We always have in dips in this industry is how do we maintain some talent and where can we keep them? And I think that's going to be the challenge not just for this industry, but frankly, I'm looking at every industry that's in a downturn today, right? I mean, you go to a hotel or a restaurant, they haven't been open. Do those restaurants open again? And how do you, where do you, those people go get a job today? And we've lost talent. And so that's going to be a a challenge for the short term. And as we recover out of this. And the industry is, like you said, used to the, the booms and busts. And is this one is of course different. Can you, is there a way to assure people that it'll come back or is it something else? You know, I don't, I I think every one of these is different and we see it come back differently. And so I'm not sure what, what quote assurance there is. I do think this industry will be here. I've grown up, grew up in Midland and we've seen it where there are lots of people there and we've seen it where there aren't that many people there. Um, Today it's kind of an in-between and look, if you're in Pecos, Texas, We want to make sure you have a job. Everybody wants to make sure you have a job. Part of that today is really getting the market back open and getting getting everybody back to work across the across the world. Quite frankly, that helps everybody find an opportunity. And the rest of this year leading into the legislative session in 2021, I mean, what is the industry going to even look like by the time the session starts in January? I think we'll see what it looks like. You know, like I said, it's changed a lot in two months. I think it'll change again in the next three to six. Um, and a lot depends on how fast demand comes back. But again, as an agency, we're going to be focused on what we do going forward, what rules need to be looked at, what the legislature comes and asks us about as far as issues. But also for us, a, this will be a budget session for us. It's going to be a, a, a challenge for us to make sure we have stability as an agency um, with fees being way down. And we've We've been through this challenge before, so we're going to go back through the education process again with the legislature. So, you know, it's I don't think anybody knows and it'll we'll, we'll have a better idea, I guess, in July as the controller comes out with, with numbers. And hopefully we start to recover before this legislature starts again in January. And I think those are 
some things that we've got to be nimble about and, and continue to be responsive. And the controller has has said agencies are going to have to, of course, prepare for for cuts. I mean, is it, what what exactly? How is the railroad commission kind of looking at that? So look, we we look at our. We've been through this before as an agency, and we look at where non essentials are as far as travel. We look at, do we need to buy equipment? Do we need to continue to hire people? It's all things like you'd run a business. That's how you run this agency. And again, we've done that. But the last time we did it was in 14, 15. And as an agency, we were off 20% by the time we finished that downturn. So that's going to be a challenge for us as an agency. And it's going to be ongoing conversations, how we consistently fund us instead of being in the dips with the oil and gas industry in the short term, too. Well, Commissioner, we are out of time. Uh, thank you so much uh, to everyone for tuning in. Thank you again, Commissioner Craddock, for, for joining us. And thank you to everyone who has supported today's event. Finally, if you want to keep tabs on the latest coronavirus news in Texas, subscribe to our evening newsletter for updates at trib.it slash coronavirus. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone, and take care.